This device is just a little Brunton compass measuring practice device. It's a piece of 4x4 four four, uh, nailed to a piece of plywood with some slots in it. And we put these uh, pieces of card in here to represent smooth, perfect planes. Nothing like you would ever see on a rock outcropping. But it's a great little device for practicing measuring strike and dip because you can vary the strike by rotating the planes relative to north. And you can vary the dip by using steeper or shallower slots. So you get lots of practice um, on top, underneath if you wish, different angles of using the brunted. So the two measurements we need to make to define uh, the orientation of a plane in space are the strike, which is the compass bearing of a horizontal line lying on the plane, and the dip, which is the angle of the steepest inclination in the plane below horizontal. So the compass has three components that we use to find those reference frames. Uh, the needle obviously tells us the angle relative to magnetic north, which is the bearing. Um, the Brunton and most other compasses actually have a rotating calibrated wheel here. So this is demarked from zero to 360 degrees. And if you know for your position on Earth and the date that you're taking your measurement, uh, the difference between magnetic and true north, you can adjust for that difference so that the number that you read is actually uh, measured relative to true north. And on a Brunton, uh, that, that compass dial can be rotated with the set screw. The NRCAN website is calculates in real time your declination, so if you enter your coordinates in lat long there, you can always tell exactly how to adjust your compass so that you never have to think about that. Uh, the compass often also has two levels. There's a bullseye level, uh, it's a round level with a circle in the middle. And when you level that bubble, uh, you're measuring that the compass is horizontal with respect to the surface of the Earth on its flat axis. And there's a bar level here which rotates, uh, and it levels at zero when the short edge of the compass is parallel to the surface of the Earth. Um, on the casing of the Brunton, there's straight edges on the sides here. Those are what I like to call the measuring edges on the Brunton compass because um, if you have one of these edges uh, flush with the plane of interest, then the magnetic needle is always going to read relative to that plane, and the, um, the bubble level also read relative to that edge of the compass. So that's your point of reference on the compass. Um, so the first step of taking a measurement is to take that measuring edge of the compass body and uh, hold it flush to the plane, and then rotate the compass around this axis and this axis until you manage to level the bubble. Now, a lot of times you see people lifting the compass up off the plane to do that. That might allow you to level the compass, but you're no longer measuring a line in the plane. So be sure to have the compass flush to the plane and rotate the compass until the bubble levels. And at that moment, you can read the bearing that this compass arm is pointing uh, off of the dial. So in this case, I've got the compass sort of pointing this way, and it's giving me a bearing of about 216. So that is measured in degrees east of north. So 216 gets us down um, into the southwest. South, this is the southwesterly direction. OK, now with this model of Brunton, in order to measure the dip, we now have to pick the compass off the plane and flip it around. And that's no problem on a simple plane like this, but in a rough surface or a complicated plane, it sometimes means that your strike and your dip measurement don't end up on exactly the same plane, and that's a source of error. So uh, in order to take the dip measurement, what we want to do is find the steepest line in the plane. Where's it going to be? I often dangle my compass like this to see if it'll fall down the steepest line. Other people have talked about pouring a bit of water from your water bottle down and seeing where it runs down the plane. It's got to be very smooth for that to work. But you don't actually have to be able to eyeball this again because you have a level. So I'm going to rotate using this little lever on the back of the casing. I'm going to rotate the bar level inside until the bubble goes right to the center of the bar level. OK, it would read at 0 on a horizontal plane, but it's inclined away from that by, I will now tell you, 20 degrees. And so. That's, this one is a bit stiff, so once you set it, you can pick it up, and it's staying at 20 degrees now, so I can take it away and read it. But that's pretty handy, because sometimes you find yourself under an outcrop, measuring overhead, measuring down below, 
So it's nice to have a setting where you can um, pick the compass up. Now you can actually do that for strike as well. So if you want to, if you're taking a strike measurement and you can't see the compass where it is, you may want to hold down this little button here, which will hold the compass needle stationary until you have a chance to take that reading. And I do use that when I'm up and under something sometimes. So, okay. once you've learned how to use the Brunton compass, the next challenge to measuring strikes and dips is to find the right location to measure. So this outcrop of Laval limestone behind me um, has really beautifully defined bedding, and that's marked by the alternating layers of light gray limestone and dark gray, slightly more clay-rich limestone. These layers display lateral continuity. That is, if you follow them from one side of the outcrop to the other, they carry on in the same direction with parallelism as far as you can trace them. So this is a nice example of lateral continuity, and knowing what we know about the original depositional environment where these limestones were laid down in the Ordovician Sea, we can also assume original horizontality. That is, that the layers, when they were first deposited, were originally horizontal and extended basically infinitely, or at least many tens of kilometers in every direction from where we're standing. The next challenge is to find an exposed plane on the surface of the outcrop that's representative of that orientation. So what we can see here behind me is that the beds are not perfectly horizontal right now. They're dipping slightly to what will appear to be this side. Um, and that is evidence of later rotation or tectonic deformation, which has happened here in the Montreal area. So selecting a surface um, requires us to have a more regional view of what is the characteristic orientation here, and then find one layer that's nicely exposed that has that orientation. We might be tempted to use this block because this is a very nicely exposed plane which lies parallel to the colored banding that represents the beds. The only problem with this block is that it's actually broken off from the main outcrop and it's tilted down toward the path here. So if we measure that, we will be measuring bedding, but it's not representative of the bedding of the outcrop. It's actually just a rotated block. So we might pick a surface like this. Maybe it's less of a big exposed plane that looks a little harder to measure, but it's better because it's in place. We call it in situ, and it's characteristic of the orientation of bedding here at this outcrop on Mount Royal. These dikes were a really fun feature, and you can see them all over Mount Royal. Because these dikes fill cracks that open during the Monta region eruptions, during the time the magma system was filling 125 million years ago, when a rock is cracked under tectonic stress, that crack orients itself to the tectonic stress. So by measuring the orientations of these dikes, we're actually reading a record of the directions of tectonic and magmatic related stresses 125 million years ago. So how are we gonna get a strike and dip on this dike? Well, uh, it's very clear what the orientation of the dike is. We can see it beautifully wrapping around. It's, it's knife edge straight on its contacts, but that contact is not very well exposed. Uh, I can't put my Brunton right on it up here. I could put the Brunton on the other underside of the dike right here. And although it's a little bit more challenging to get it in the right place, you can make a measurement by holding the Brunton underneath a surface like this. Another alternative that geologists commonly do is to hold something planar, like a notebook, in the orientation of the dike. Sometimes this is good to have a field partner to help you with that. And then you can take a measurement right on the surface of your notebook as a proxy for the dike. Obviously, that incorporates a little bit more error because if you're not holding it exactly parallel, then you may end up with a reading that's not exactly accurate. But also, if the surface is somewhat wavy, then a real reading of the surface would systematically vary along the wavy, wavy bumps. So sometimes placing your notebook as a proxy helps you average across undulations on the surface and get a nice average orientation. Okay, so there are lots of different conventions in use, especially different conventions in different parts of the world about how strike and dip are recorded or reported. For example, a horizontal line in this plane really has two ends. So I could have said, 220, or I could have said 04040, it's northeast, southwest, it's a straight line going across the compass. Now, um, 
and for my preferred convention is to not have a convention and always report a strike line, report a dip, and report a dip direction. That way nobody can mistake the data. So I would say 040 or 220 measuring the dip is 20 degrees and the direction of the dip is the other thing we want to measure. So this is north, east, southwest. That means this is southeast, 20 degrees southeast dip. Um, some of the other conventions you might come across are things like right hand rule. Um, there are two different and opposite right hand rules that are in use in, in different countries. So I try to stay away from conventions, but um, a lot of software, if you put this data into software and you're plotting, they will often use more simplified conventions so that instead of having three different pieces of letters and numbers to express the strike and dip, that you can do it a little bit simply. But um, keep track of the conventions when you're working with other people's data in particular. take a strike and dip is to decide where to take it. So, hey buddy. I'm sorry to get one with you.